Uh, it's great to have you in the show, and I'm very much looking forward to digging into this subject around helping uh, HR people, but also leaders within companies become better at communication, because as you know, we all know that everything deals with communication. It's sort of like the lifeblood of all social interactions is how we communicate. If we don't get better at that, we can't get better in so many other aspects of our jobs. And and uh, the problem, of course, as you know, is that we become unconscious of how we communicate and therefore all our bad habits start to show up again. So I want to I want to pose a, a topic to get this ball rolling. There was a guy that we did a 360 um, you know, assessment on. He was actually the executive of this large company. And one of the things that came out of his 360 was he needs to be more succinct and get more to the point because during meetings in which he leads, which most of the meetings because he was CEO, he leads. He rambles and we don't know where he's going and he's thinking and talking at the same time. And we're just trying to stay focused without looking at our phones because we're so gosh darn bored. What do you say to a person like that who thinks and finds their idea while they're talking? How do you help them become more concise? Great question. It reminds me, there's a scene in The Office where Michael Scott, if you haven't seen The, uh, the Office, Michael Scott is kind of the head boss. Yeah. And there's, there's a really funny scene in there where he just kind of starts rambling on, rambling on. He's talking for about a minute straight, not really saying anything. Then it cuts to the scene where he's talking to the camera and he says, sometimes I open my mouth and I start talking and I have no idea what I'm gonna say, but I just kind of hope that I find it along the way. And some of us can relate to that where you open your mouth, but you don't really have a plan. You're not really sure where this is going. You're kind of hoping for the best you're essentially just rolling the dice, right? You're taking a chance. Remember early in my career, I was in a team meeting. It was one of the first jobs I ever had in the professional world, and I was selling life insurance. So it was a team meeting, and the point came up. My boss asked me what I thought, and so I gave my answer as best as I could, and he said, yeah, but what do you think? <laughs> and it became very apparent that I had said a lot of words, but I hadn't actually given a clear point. And so that stuck with me clearly because I was very embarrassed. And most people actually won't call that out. They'll just be like, mm, okay, mm-hmm. And especially if you're the leader that are working for you, probably aren't going to call you out and say, yeah, but what's your point? Okay, so this is actually one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people have, and especially when in meetings. We're tight for time, right? We've got a schedule. We've got an agenda. Nobody wants to hear a five-minute answer that could take 30 seconds. So there's a very simple thing you can do, and it's just learning to organize your thoughts and ideas a little bit more as you're speaking. So I'll give you a simple framework that you can start using, and it's called point, reason, point, Good. PRP. So first, you always want to think, what's the main point you're trying to make? So if somebody says, what do you think the best option is here? You would start with, the best option is X. Right? You wouldn't say, well, you know, actually, all the options sound pretty good. You know, I've, tr I've tried this one um, before. And, you know, the other one, like, yeah, there's pros and cons here. It's like, no, start with the best option is X. That's your point. Next, your reason. So why? Why is this the best option? You could give one reason, two reasons, three reasons. However many you need to support your point without obviously rambling on Droning on, you can follow a framework and still bore people to death. You want to be as concise as possible within these reasons. There's two reasons you can organize it even more and say, now there are two reasons why this is the best option. Reason number one, reason number two, B. So once you've given your reason or reasons, you restate that point. That's why this is the best option. Okay? That's why I mean, X is the best. It's a great model. I, I think that's so well thought out just the model itself so let me counter that and i am one of those people that i just described i find my point of view while i'm talking case in point we have a gal that we just hired to help me write a book i've been wanting to write a book for 30 years why haven't i i've got so many ideas i don't know how to shape them and so I, so I told this, this delightful person, I said, I need you to interview me and let me just ramble so that I can figure out what's in my head 
and then hopefully you can help me make sense of it. So I suffer from this creative spur of the moment process whereby I suppose if I didn't say anything, I could come up with my point and my reason and to restate my point just the way you had just so well described. But the engine of my thinking gets so much better results, I think, when I'm speaking while I'm thinking. So is this a process by which really only works for certain styles of leaders and communicators? Or do you think this works for, and maybe the better question is, what is your answer to the person who does this so well and also gets into trouble by thinking and talking at the same time? Good question. I would say there's a time and a place for both, both being you finding your point as you go, creative brainstorming. And there's a time and a place when we've got stuff to figure out, we're on a tight schedule, let's be right direct to the point as much as we can. So it also depends on, you know, are you struggling with this? Do you find your points and you're like, yeah, I'm happy with this. And then people around you are saying, yes, that's great. Let's move forward. Let's discuss that more. Or do you find that you're kind of rambling and then people are just saying, mm, mm hmm, mm hmm, what does everyone else think? Right, so what are the responses that you're getting? Mm -hmm. If what you're doing is working, I mean, I'm not gonna tell you to change your entire communication style, but I would also challenge you and say that a lot of people, yourself included, maybe just haven't trained your brain to work in that way in certain situations. So think of it kind of like a tool you can use when you need to. A lot of people that I start working with, a lot of these executives, they'll come and just say, well, my brain doesn't work like that, or I'm just not confident in these situations. I'm great in these situations, I'm not as good in these. Like I'm good at this, bad at that. But are they really bad or are they just untrained? Have they just not practiced enough? Have they just not learned it? So to answer your question, I think there's definitely a time and a place for both and you should have both tools in your tool belt. Think of this just as a tool you can use, especially if you have people around you that are like, what's the point? I need it now. And you wanna be clear and concise because you're on a tight schedule, tight meeting. There's gonna be a time and a place for both styles. Fair enough. What about the other personality style out there, the person who is not comfortable speaking in front of others? I described a situation where somebody is very comfortable, in fact, prefers to do so. The flip side, you've got a person who is smart, has a lot to offer. In fact, I was just talking to one this morning. People don't know what their point of view is because they don't necessarily have the confidence to, to share what their thoughts are. And so they go left unsaid during meetings where their ideas could have been very helpful. What's your pointers or your suggestions for the quiet, but smart, brilliant individual who doesn't say anything? I can definitely relate to that being the quiet, not saying anything. Maybe not the smart and brilliant as much, but I remember <laughs> growing up, definitely I was the shy, awkward kid. I grew up actually on a very small farm near a very small town in Western Canada. And so I was the classic introvert. I wanted to just avoid people at all costs. She had an older sister who was very much a bubbly, outgoing extrovert. And she would speak for me. So growing up as a kid, if I was asked a question, my sister would jump in, jump in and say, let me tell you what Ty thinks. So I can definitely relate to just kind of being that person that's hiding in the background, doesn't really want to speak up. And for these people, let's say you are that person, it's kind of like any other skill where you just have to start small. So I always encourage a person like that to don't start by sharing all these big ideas because that's actually really hard. It's like trying to run before you start walking. So just start by maybe just like asking a question. Start by maybe just agreeing with somebody. Start by just sharing something small. You kind of have to work up almost the tolerance for that discomfort. And the earlier that you can say something in a meeting or, or a situation like that, usually the easier it's mm. gonna be. And then once you do that, you know, you're gonna challenge yourself to say one thing each meeting, no matter how small. Once you do it enough, like, okay, that wasn't so bad. I think I can do this. Let's share a little bit more, a little bit more. And so if you challenge yourself, then you'll eventually get to the point where it just feels a little bit more natural. It's still not gonna be fun. I can relate to that for a while, but you'll feel better doing it. Now, 
What if you have somebody like that on your team? What if you're the leader in that position? And so what we want to do to try to encourage people like that to speak, we want to call on them, but we don't want it to be totally out of the blue because that freaks them out and they're going to be more rattled and not be able to explain their points well. So we actually want to kind of prime them or prepare them beforehand. So as part of you know, a meeting invite, you can say, I'm going to ask each one of you to share your thoughts on this. So just let them know beforehand. Mm. So that's, okay, they're going into that and they're like, okay, I know I'm going to have to say something. I'm nervous, but like, it's not a surprise then. And you can even give them the topic if you actually want something specific. You can say, I'm going to ask each one of you for your thoughts on this. One of the worst things you can do is just throw, like, somebody that's never spoken before, just throw them out right out there to the wolves and say, what do you think, Dean? And Dean, never spoken before, is scared and caught off guard and... He, that's going to actually discourage him from speaking again or her. So that's what I would say if you're that person yourself, just start small. If you have somebody like that on your team, just give them a little heads up beforehand so you don't totally shock them. It's a great idea. I love that. It reminds me of something you just said about not being prepared or being shocked around a much larger, higher risk situation of public speaking. You're not in a meeting with just a few people. Now you're in front of maybe hundreds of people and how we've heard for years that it's the number one fear of most people is public speaking. And when I've some of our executives on public speaking, when you really drill down, and I'm, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on this, Ty, it's more the psychological coefficient to fear of public speaking. As well, we kind of found out as we dug in further, we realized that the public speaking person was afraid of that role because of they were concerned about being judged. They were concerned about looking stupid or some other variation of feeling not good. Enough. And now you've got not one eye on you or two eyes, but you've got 500 eyes looking at you all with a concern of maybe I'm not good enough. So it really creates a tremendous amount of stress because it, it's, uh, it goes back to our childhood possibly around feeling worthy enough to say something. But when we coached them, we found that if we could help them try to put that concern aside just for a second and go back to your model around what's your main point, what's the thing that is so important for the audience to know, and zero in on that, zero in on the passion behind the message, the passion behind why you want them to know this and why it's so important. It can sometimes cut through all that fear of self and take it away from it's about me to now it's about you. You need to know this. What's your thoughts on that approach? What's your thoughts of changing the mindset of speaking, whether it be a small group or a large group? Actually, one of my favorite kind of reframes when it comes to public, public speaking as well, because it's actually one of the biggest mistakes people make is that it's all about them. Mm -hmm. It's all about me looking smart, sounding awesome being amazing in front of all these people and impressing them. But it's really about helping the people that are there, sharing some value and teaching them something. I 100% support putting the focus on them. How can you help them? A lot of that anxiety sometimes comes from just the uncertainty because they haven't practiced enough. So one of the simplest things, but it's not fun to do, is just say the words out loud more. If you had to go up on stage and tell everyone your name, and like what city you grew up in, you wouldn't be nervous. Like, well, I know those things. Maybe a little bit nervous. It's not nearly as nervous as the presentation you would give. So one of the easiest things, for sure, is just say the words out loud more. Get so comfortable with them that you take a lot of the uncertainty out. You know what you're going to say. That will help a lot. And if we're talking about more of the inner game, one of the reframes that I like to teach as well in terms of perspective is imagine that you're just going to practice. So practice versus performance has been really helpful for me and a lot of my clients. So instead of, okay, I'm going to give this presentation, this big speech, hundreds of people, and I want to put on a show. If you see it as, I'm just going to practice my speaking, whatever happens, happens. This is just a practice session for me. Then it takes so much pressure off. Right, because it's actually not a make or break moment. 
very few situations, if any, are make or break moments where like if you mess up some words, you know, are you gonna lose your career? Are you gonna get mm. divorced? Like probably not. Right. And so thinking mm. about this just as practice, just for like what's the worst that could happen? It's not nearly as bad as you make it out to be in your brain. So I'm just gonna go practice my speaking. If you're having a difficult conversation with a team member, I'm gonna go practice having difficult conversations. So now everything is just about getting a little bit better and building your skills versus trying to impress anyone. That's a great idea. It make me think of two things. One, my dad, when he was around many years ago, when I was much younger, he was much younger, uh, we'd go play tennis and he would say, let's just have a practice game. It wasn't a real game of tennis. It's a practice game. And he was like messing with my head to make me relax so that I wouldn't try to perform. I was also just listening to something about Prince, the, the musician Prince. And it just, uh, he actually was in my neighborhood when we grew up and I went to my high school. Didn't know him personally, but knew of him. But there was this interview about the people that worked with Prince. And he said he approached all of his recording sessions in a way like practice and that he was able to crank out so much work within a relatively short of time, much more so than anybody else they had worked with because he wanted to be in the flow. He wanted the experience to be fun and in the relaxed practice state that you might call it. And even if there were a few mistakes in it, he didn't care because that was part of the energy that got sent out to the album or the CD or what have you. He thought that that was part of the product, was the mistakes. You know, it was more important to, to be in the state of practice than in the state of perfection. And I thought that's a great way of describing it, you know? And so your reframe around practice, I think is absolutely right on the money. It takes the pressure off of us. I love it. Absolutely two great examples there, one from sports and from music. The, the concept actually initially I learned from a, it was a sports psychologist, actually. Uh, Alan Goldberg, I believe was his name. And so that's actually where I first heard the concept because he discovered that athletes, just like you and your dad playing tennis, athletes would perform significantly better in practice than they'd have slumps during games. And it was just because of how they approached it. Absolutely. So that would almost say, if it's true that athletes have that sort of experience, when it comes to this topic around performance, you must have the same idea that it's true in business. That if we have the same approach towards running a meeting, having a crucial conversation, giving a speech, and we're doing it under the mindset of practice, we'll probably do better than if we were thinking that it's live, ready to go, got to be perfect. Great analogy. Great. So other, other quick thing I wanted to pivot to for a second here, if I could, Ty. So we've got this idea about meetings and people being more succinct in their meetings and focusing on more the point versus finding their point while they're talking. All this is really good. Thinking that it's practice versus having to be perfect. What about the different meetings we have? I mean, if you were to think of the fact that it, it, a mid-level manager may have, I don't know, in a period of a week, I'm trying to think about what the statistics were, but probably around 18 to 20 hours a week in meetings. That's a lot of time spent. That's more than 50% of your time spent in a meeting. But you're going from one meeting to another. You finish one, you get up, and you go to another one. Or maybe it's a Zoom or WebEx call. You turn off, you go into another one. And sometimes there's literally seconds between meetings. What's your suggestion for these leaders, whether they be HR, team leaders to be able to reset for the new meeting. So we don't bring the garbage from the last meeting and just dump it into the current one. That's a perfect analogy. And sometimes we even bring the garbage from our day or the garbage from our personal lives and bring it to work as well. So yeah, that's very well said. This is a big one actually, and this will help you radically become a better communicator because how much easier is it to communicate when you're a little bit more relaxed, you're a little bit more calm, versus when you're frustrated, you're angry, or you're you know, annoyed at somebody. It's a lot easier to speak when you're in that more calm state. So taking just a couple minutes between those meetings to recenter, get into a better state of mind, will actually do wonders for the way that you're showing up and the results that you're having from those situations. So I teach a, a quick process. This can be done in 20 seconds. There's four quick steps. 
It's a acronym SBVS. Okay, so the first S is straight. This just means sit up straight, make sure you have strong upright body language. There's a big connection between your body language and your emotional state. Mm. So for example, if you make yourself really small, you cross your arms, you kind of hunch together, you actually feel less confident. You feel kind of down, lower energy versus if you open up your body language, you got your head up, chest up, body language is nice and open. You feel more energetic, you feel more confident and more relaxed. So that's the first thing you're gonna do, sit up straight. The B is breathe, but it's not just any type of breath. There's a specific breath called the physiological sigh. Andrew Huberman popularized this. So it's a double inhale through the nose, one long inhale, then one short, and then a nice long exhale through the mouth. Okay, so double inhale through the nose, one long, one short, then a single nice long exhale through the mouth. Now the science actually shows this is the fastest way to shift your state from being mm. frustrated, uptight, stressed, to calm, relaxed, peaceful. So you can do that in 20 seconds, only two of those, that's all you need. And then the V is visualize. So just spend a couple of seconds either visualizing the situation going well that you're about to have, or some people like to visualize something or someone that brings them joy. So a family member, could be a pet, could be your kids, something that brings you joy, could be a vacation spot, and so as you're closing your eyes, doing your breaths, you're sitting up straight, you're visualizing something that puts you into a better state. And then you end that with that final S, which is a smile. So at this point, it should be easy to smile if you're visualizing something that makes you happy. And there's all sorts of science behind even just the power of a smile, the feel-good chemicals it releases in your brain. So we've got sit up straight, so that first S, breathe, the B with the physiological sigh, Visualize is the V, and then that final S is smile. Excellent. Love it. Usable. Good ideas. To tack on to that, let me ask you about a couple other thoughts around things that we have worked with clients on. So you've got your state now realigned in, in a much better place. After that, I would wonder about what's my intention for this upcoming meeting? So you've got the visualization to get you into a better state with the breathing, with, this, with the posture. Now I'm going into this meeting. What do I want as a result of this meeting? How do I want to be in, in this meeting? What kind of energy do I want to have? What kind of energy do I want to inspire in others? What's my goal in this meeting? You know, those sort of intentional focus areas. That goes back to your thought of public speaking or going back to your thought around communication is what's your intention? What's, what's the purpose? What's the point? What's the point of this meeting? Why am I here? What's your thoughts about adding to your model another piece around intentionality for the desired outcome of the meeting? Absolutely love it. One of the most powerful things you can do as part of your agendas that you make for meetings too is the goal, right? What's the goal for the meeting? Which we can really say that is kind of like the intention, right? It's the intention for the group. So if the intention for yourself is to show up a certain way, It'll be much, much, much easier to do that if you're in the right state. So if your intention is to show up calm and peaceful and relaxed, but you're frustrated and you're all wound up from a, an email that someone sent to you, then that's going to be pretty difficult. A lot of my clients, they'll do SBVS like 10 times, 15 times a day. It just gets so fast. They'll do it constantly, even if they're at home with their kids yeah. and their loved ones. We need it with our families sometimes too, let's be real. And so... That plus layering on the intention, my goal is to, let's say, be a better listener. Because I usually talk a little bit too much in these meetings. My goal is to listen and deeply understand my team during this conversation. My goal is to come up with a resolution for this problem. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely love adding intention into that. That's great. That's great. So there was an adding to your idea that made me think about in terms of more of a virtual perspective. So sometimes now we don't have meetings that are face to face. You know, COVID certainly changed that. A lot of organizations have some sort of a work from home policy. I think probably there's a minority of companies that are 100 percent back at brick and mortar locations it might be trending more in that direction. But nonetheless, we are using Zoom and WebEx and and other teams much more so than we ever have prior to COVID. And so a lot of our meetings are in a situation like you and I are having right now. 
So I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman that I had on this podcast about a year or two ago, but his suggestion was to stand, if at all possible, which I'm not right now doing, because it changes your energy, your posture to your point. But also to, uh, there was two other things that he mentioned, which I'll throw out was try to stand far enough back from the camera so that we can see your hands because your hands communicate 20% of your meaning. And I thought that's, or of your meaning. And I thought that was brilliant. He also said, don't get too close to the camera because it sets off this subconscious pre-perception uh, reaction that basically tells us subconsciously, Ty's too close to me. He's in my personal space. I now am uncomfortable by how close he is. We don't think about it when we're on a Zoom call because we know we're not actually in front of that person. But subconsciously, if we're too close to the camera, we create stress that is not necessary. And his point was, a lot of the reason why we have Zoom fatigue is not from sitting on our butt for eight hours. It's because we're too close to the camera. So I thought those are a couple of other quick ideas that might be useful for the people that are listening in on this in terms of communication. So that one other quick thing here, shift to the HR person or shift to the leader who has to give a message that is tough, a crucial conversation. Uh, I'm going to have to do a, you know, some sort of an accountability conversation with you. I got to point out that you're not doing well. A lot of people get very nervous about that. I think it's one of the hardest, least understood, least done well skills that leaders have right now is that ability to have those kind of conversations. A lot of research is done on this. We've got a lot of books and, and programs on it, crucial conversations being one of them that I know a lot of our listeners know about. What's your sense on this? How, what, are there some ideas or tips to help the leader or the HR person get better at having these very difficult conversations? Absolutely. The number of clients in leadership positions that I work with that are just so resistant to giving feedback. It's like, I'll only do it if I absolutely have to, or like, you know, maybe that, you know, quarterly review, I can save it till then. People are so afraid to give feedback because number one, they're not really taught how to do it. Number two, they're afraid of saying the wrong thing, maybe offending someone, maybe a person sensitive, they don't want to hurt any feelings. It's totally understandable, but that's not an excuse to not give a person feedback. So there's a couple of things that I'll touch on for this. The first is that you never want to make it about the person as an individual, the human, always about just the behavior, right? So if I say, Dean, you are lazy, right? Now I'm labeling you as something, or Dean, a person that doesn't show up on time, versus saying, Dean, when you don't show up on time, this is what happens. And I'm just talking about the action itself instead of the person. So we never want to attach any labels to the individual. We only want to speak about the very isolated behavior. Okay, so there's a framework that I can give for this too, because people like frameworks, they like the tangible things to use. One that I like is behavior, outcome, future action. So Here's the behavior, here's what you did. The outcome of that is what actually happened here when you do this thing, right? Like what are the consequences? What are the results of this? Just so that they understand how important it is. And then what do you want them to do differently moving forward? So what I always recommend, because a lot of people wing these situations too, right? And it's kind of like, you know, speaking in meetings when you're rambling, sometimes they ramble because they're like a little bit nervous and they're just throwing all this stuff against the wall, hoping that it sticks. And then the person that you're giving the feedback to is like, what, what, is, what is my boss saying right now? What is my HR person saying right now? I don't get this. So always prepare and you can actually write out, okay, what's the thing that they did that I want to talk about? What's the behavior? Okay, what are the results or consequences? What's the outcome of this? And what's the future actions? Like, what do I want them to do differently? So just spending the time to actually do that. Prepare like you're preparing for a little mini presentation. Spend a few minutes writing this out. And then it's fine to have your notes in front of you and like glance down at your notes just to make sure you're hitting on all the points. A lot of my clients start just freestyling this. And I'm always like, this does not work well. 
you end up saying all sorts of things that you regret or the person doesn't actually change because they don't understand you. So being a little bit more practical and following a step-by-step -step system like that tends to make a huge difference for people. Great stuff. I would add one thing to your model at the very end. So you've got, what, what was the first one? How did you describe the first one? Behavior. Behavior. Do. Second one was outcome. Third Second one was yep. future action. So future action. I would say, yeah. the, I would add another outcome to the future action. Almost like, what's the benefit? So you did this. This is the result of what you did. This is what we'd like to see happen future behavior. And when you do, this is the benefit you and others will achieve. So now we have sort of like a closed loop process. You know, this is the behavior that's not working so well, follow the bouncing ball, go all the way around. This is the benefit if you do what we're asking you to do. And so it, I kind of like leading on a high note, not just the action of the future behavior, but like what would be the you know, to them and the other members of the team, the company, what have you. I love it. It's good stuff. Really great. So Ty, you know, we could talk on all day about this stuff because there's so many different components to this. So how, how can people follow you? What sort of things are you up to? Tell us a little bit about you, your work, and, and how a person listening in on this conversation can learn. Absolutely. So first of all, Dean, this has been a really awesome conversation. You asked some good questions. We were upgrading the frameworks together live here on Leadovation, so I absolutely love it. <laughs> I could talk about this stuff absolutely all day. And so I just want to recognize you, uh, you as well. You've done, I think it was 220 episodes. At we're at well 240 now. Depending yeah. on when this comes out, yeah. depending on when this comes out, it'll be, it's well over 200. Yeah. So I just want to recognize you for that, the way that you show up for your community. You definitely over-deliver, so I want to stay on brand here, and I want to over-deliver for your audience. So I'm going to give away something for free here that I typically only give for paying clients. So it's called the CEO Communication Kit. So there's two parts to this. First part, it's a course. It's called Speak Like a Confident Leader in Seven Days. So what this course does basically shows you how to speak with the confidence, charisma, and clarity of the world's top leaders in that seven-day period. And the second part of the CEO communication kit, this is something I usually only do for VIP clients, and it's called the secrets to CEO level presence. Okay, so with this, I'm actually going to teach this to you if you're listening on a live one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me personally, yeah. just basically as a gift to say, thanks for listening to the show, thanks for listening to Dean and Lead Ovation, thanks for listening to the end. And so if you want to get the CEO communication kit, all you have to do is just message me on Instagram or LinkedIn, and it's at Ty Hosgen, that's T-Y-H-O-E-S-G-E-N. The last name's a little bit tricky, so I'll say it again, bye. H-O-E-S-G-E-N, and just message me the word. That way I'll know you'll came from this podcast. I don't know exactly which gift to give you. So it's the CEO communication kit. It's the course of Speak Like a Confident Leader in Seven Days and the Secrets to CEO Level Presence, which I will teach to you live one-on-one -on, -one on a coaching call. So message me CEO24 on Instagram or LinkedIn. Well, I just did it. I'm looking forward to learning more. Great stuff and great, excuse me, great offer. I really appreciate uh, you being able to do that for our listeners. And I hope some stuff uh, is able to uh, turn for you as well. You're very authentic. You you walk your talk. Um, a lot of people are students of, of communication. You, you live it. And you can just tell uh, those of you who can see Ty's presence, the man is just He's here and he's present and he's communicating with authenticity and clarity. And it's, it's uh, what it does is it makes me more clear being around you. I don't know whether you notice that about yourself, but the, when you start, your presence evokes better presence for me. So, oh, I appreciate that. You it's really true. It's the other way around where people are self-conscious and they think that I'm constantly analyzing them which I am, but sometimes people will be like, oh, I don't want to say any ums around you. And yeah, it's, it's fine. If you meet me, please just know that I am analyze, analyzing you, but don't worry about it. 
I can't help it either when I go to like a presentation of somebody else, you know, or, or a public speaker, or even I go to a play or anything of, you know, somebody's presenting something to a crowd. I help. I can't help myself. I'm always just looking at how I would have done it differently or what I liked about it. It's those few times when I just am totally lost in what they do that uh, I know I'm in, in the presence of a master. So I feel the same way with you. So thank you so much for your, your energy and your, your great insights. They're really good. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for having me as a guest here on Leadovation. This was a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed it.